This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to this uh, third panel today of this um, fantastically stimulating conference. Um, uh, this uh, subject of this afternoon's panel uh, is Breaking Free of Documents, Collections in the Global Histories. Um, and um, as the biographies are in the pack, I'm going to hand straight over to Professor Margot Finn um, from University College London. Great. Well, thanks very much. Um, I am going to be uh, speaking to our website instead of to slide, so I hope this is not a disaster. Um, this presentation is going to have two main goals. Um, the first is I want to use a three-year Leverhulme funded project called the East India Company at Home as a case study in using collections of material objects uh, to produce global histories. Um, but also, I think, um, to rethink what we mean when we talk about the archive. Um, and that's obviously relevant to what we're doing here today. And I think that in the sessions before, what we have been doing explicitly and implicitly is rethinking what the archive is and where it is and how we access it and who it is who is accessing it. So that's the, the first half, really, of what I'll be doing. And then the second part of what I want to do is to explore the different ways in which issues of public and private, uh, particularly public archives, private archives, um, play into, shape, uh, perhaps distort, um, how we can do global histories and global material histories. And again, I'll be focus on, focusing on the East India Company as, as a particular way of thinking about that. So that's a broad overview of the two goals I have in, in speaking to you today. Um, I'm going to start by explaining to you what this three-year Levium funded project, the East India Company at Home, is. Um, and then I'm going to have a quick trot with you through the website, which is our hub, um, and then I want to look at three particular case studies as ways of thinking about these issues um, that I've raised. And I hope then in the discussion session we can come back to um, both some of the strategies, some of what I'll be talking about today is methodological and pragmatic, but also some of the problems um, that are posed by doing global histories, doing material histories, and particularly doing um, not just public engagement, but uh, historical projects that are done with communities rather than at communities of non-academic um, historians. So that's hopefully where I'll end up. So um, what's the East India Company at Home? Um, the project um, was conceived by um, myself and Helen Clifford in the first instance as a project that had a series of research questions but also a series of methodological um, questions. And the main research questions really had to do with um, if we look at that iconic um, national English country house, Scottish country house, Welsh country house, um, how can we fit this national icon into an emerging narrative of global history? What is the global history of the stately home in Britain? So that was an overarching set of research questions that we were asking. And it's important to say that the project was um, conceived and delivered at Warwick University. Unsurprisingly, obviously, um, the um, wonderful influence of my former colleague, Maxine Berg, both from Luxury, uh, which very much informs our project, her, her work on Luxury, and then her founding of the Global History and Culture Center, which is animating um, much of what's coming to us. We were really born in that institution, in that moment, between the transition uh, between Maxine's Luxury Center and the Global Center. And that's obviously informing our uh, thinking of using the country house to think about global histories. Now, obviously, a caveat right there. Um, the country house um, lends itself much more easily to elite histories than to non-elite histories. Uh, using the country house as a way of exploring the history of the East India Company uh, makes it for a very Anglo as opposed to a very transnational history. And I'm aware of those limitations and happy to discuss them subsequently. But I think that when one looks at um, current depictions of what Englishness is, both in England and particularly thanks to television and film outside of England, you can't escape the dead arm of the country house. Um, think of Gosford Park, think of the bloody Downton Abbey, think more recently of landings. I mean, it's this constant recurrence to the English uh, country house or the British country house is something that exudes national identity. So we wanted to disrupt this narrative, but also to explore it. So that was one of the crucial things um, that we do, to, to try and um, de-Daltonize the country house, I suppose, one of the ways of, of saying it. 
But methodologically, we were also very, very keen to ask the question, how can academically based historians doing an academic project, asking academic questions, engage systematically, fruitfully, productively with the many community-based historians who are doing history all the time in the archive, uh, through the internet, and not in ways that are systematically connected to academic research. How can you take this information that appears, if you go into Google, to be random, um, and somehow connect it to the project that we're engaged in, in writing new global histories? Because I think if we fail to do that, then um, we are often, academics often condemn local historians, community-based historians as somehow being antiquarian, or family historians as being just genealogists. Well, if we're not engaging with those kinds of histories and working with it and thinking through with it, we're in no position to critique its analytical perspectives. So part of what we were trying to do is take that new boom, that incredible boom in everybody thinking, I can do history, I want to write history, and connecting it up with a more academic project. Um, and I'll describe in a moment methodologically how we've done that. Um, so there's both a, a series of questions about that national icon of the country house, but then a series of methodological questions about how do we in the 21st century do history, and who are the we? What is the public that does history? And should there be a demarcation between so-called public history on the one hand and academic history on the other? So that's a series of methodological questions we're asking. To do that, we have essentially in the project um, a threefold structure. We've got a core group whose image I may just be about to bring up. Uh, there we are, um, four of us, plus one of our advisory board members, um, Ellen Filer, uh, Kate Smith. Uh, Ellen's the PhD student on the project, working on these uh, East India Company families of the Scottish borders and their material and other histories. Uh, Kate Smith, who's a full-time postdoc, Helen Clifford, who's the part-time postdoc, shared with Maxine and um, the wonderful Keith Sweetmore. Um, Keith represents the second layer um, of our pro uh, project team. We have a fantastically good advisory board, uh, a few of whom are located at universities, but most of whom are based in archives, in national libraries. Uh, Keith, when the project began, was, um, uh, ran the North Yorkshire Record Office, uh, now has a more prominent role um, with uh, national archives. Um, Sue Strong at the VNA. Uh, Margaret Makepeace, the invaluable Margaret Makepeace, the curator of the East India Company collection at the British Library. And these persons have been absolutely crucial to us, not just because they're subject specialists with extraordinary knowledge of their archives and their collections, not just because they have privileged access to archives and collections, but also because they have sustained working relationships with the public. Uh, to whom they've always felt responsible. So we've been connected to large constituencies of other historians outside the university uh, framework very rapidly by being able to tap into their networks. And for anyone who's thinking about uh, writing a grant proposal, get your advisory board in place before you put the application in because it will save you years of struggle and be much more productive. So that's our second level. Our third level, which I'm, I'm deeply I'm actually very proud of, because this has worked extremely well. We have a third level of currently about 280 project associates. And these are people who simply fill out a form on our website, join up to um, be associated with the project, either very extensively or um, at a more modest level. The most modest level is they simply get our newsletter every month. Uh, it costs them nothing. It's only front and back of an A4 piece of paper, uh, but tells them what we've been doing uh, in the course of the month. Project associates who choose to join and participate more actively, and they include Sarah at, the, at one end of the table, um, can uh, attend workshops, participate in uh, public outreach activities, and also, if they choose to do so, write a case study, either focused on a stately home, an object, or set of objects associated with the East India Company in the, the stately home, or a family or individual associated with the East India Company in that context. And we then publish those case studies on the website. I'll be coming back to that in a moment. Uh, uh, Cam and um, 
uh, Sarah wrote a wonderful case study, which will flip onto your screen if I go back to the home page, on a casket of Tipu Sultan. You have before you our most recently published case study on cane furniture. Uh, I do worry a little bit when you publish on cane furniture whether cane fanaticists will be hitting our <laughs> website. So the Google Analytics stats for February are going to be very interesting, is all I'll see. Uh, Chinese staircases in northeast uh, Wales, um, produced by another project associate. Who are the project associates? Uh, of 280 of them, about a third are based in universities. Those include undergraduates, postgraduates, and uh, academic staff, some academic administrators. About a third are based in libraries and archives and museums, and about a third are, lo are located in uh, family history, local history, National Trust volunteers, members of NADFAS, etc. Uh, that's a somewhat artificial description because a lot of people have multiple identities, obviously. And they have brought a kind of energy, knowledge, expertise, interest to the project that for me has been real, one of the real joys um, of participating in it. And they've given us, as I'll be explaining in a few moments, access to a very different archive than we would have by only walking the 10 minutes to the British Library and looking at the East India Company collections. And that, for me, again, has been one of the most interesting things, I think, that we've done. So the website forms a, a hub, really, and we've got a lot of different things on it. Uh, resources, which include um, some annotated bibliographies so that um, family historians, community-based historians, students are trying to get their head around the East India Company, have a few suggestions as to where to start. Uh, similarly, if they're trying to um, learn about the stately home or learning about uh, consumer culture, they can start with one of our bibliographies. A couple of think pieces, uh, one of my favorite ones of which was um, recently written by um, uh, Chris Jefferson, and uh, where is it? Uh, I don't have it there, but it should be there under think pieces. Um, and Chris wrote a very interesting piece that was about um, the ways in which the East India Company's families are connected to the slave-owning families um, of the Caribbean plantations. So we're trying to get up on the website a series of resources that people might want to use, but most importantly, to provide a way of publishing online and open access um, systematic research that's done by our project associates as well as by our core team. And that's really what I want to uh, focus on for most of this talk. However, having said that, and this goes back to a point that um, Dan made and that came up in particular in the last um, session, um, our project wouldn't work in terms of um, engaging with this large community of historians if we didn't have in situ meetings with people. I can't emphasize enough the way in which it's enriching to have study days, workshops, conferences, and the rest to get to know your constituency. You begin conversations that then continue on, and people invest in interesting ways. People are much more willing to listen to other perspectives if they've met people. So I am very skeptical about the complete digitization of um, state archives and other archives as a substitute for people actually meeting together, having conversations together. I think there's a, a level of enrichment that you just get by putting those kinds of activities in there that you can't get through digital environments. Now, digital environments are very, very important for giving people who don't have geographical access to your collections access to what you're doing. But in and of themselves, I think they would yield an impoverished way um, of doing history. And I think that really should be written into every grant proposal that people write. So that's the, the website, it's a hub. I hope all of you go to it um, very soon. And if you want to become a project associate, someone's about to leap up and pass lovely leaflets down the side uh, to people. Um, I've got a few spare at the front. The lovely leaflet explains what we're doing, invites you to collaborate. You can have a look at it, pass it around, and become our 281st project associate by the end of the day. Obviously, we do Twitter and all those other things too, and that's um, all very fine and dandy. Let me talk to you about three case studies that illustrate uh, some of our agendas, but I also think some of the shared agendas here. And I'm going to start with the Indian seal of um, Sir Francis Sykes. Sir Francis Sykes was an 18th century nabob, that is to say he was an East India Company um, servant, merchant, um, who made a spectacular fortune um, in mid-18th century India, which he then remitted back um, to Britain uh, in order to purchase not just one country house and country estate, but actually several. Um, Sykes um, 
Well, Sykes is an interesting person in and of himself. And one of our project associates is Sir John Sykes, the lineal descendant of Sir Francis Sykes, um, who joined us at our first uh, workshop study day at the British Library and brought along with him the Persian seal of Sir Francis Sykes. And of course, as a man of business in the 18th century, Sykes had to have a seal. That seal, because Persian was the, um, the language of, of business, the language of state in 18th century India, including company India, had to be in Persian. And when Sykes went back to Britain, leaving a significant portion of his wealth still in India, where the interest rates were very, very high, he left his seal with his Indian banyan, his Indian man of business, in whose family the seal stayed for nearly two centuries, being returned to Sir Francis Sykes via the great-great-great-great-grandson of Sykes's Indian Banyan. So what we have here is a case study which is both about that Indian seal in the 18th century, but also about the history of two families, one an Indian elite merchant family and the other an Indian landed family uh, in much of the 18th and 19th century through um, loot, basically, um, repatriated from India. And Sykes is an interesting, uh, Sykes in the 21st century Sykes is a very interesting case of somebody who, very interested in his family history, uh, wrote the Oxford DMB entry for Sir Francis um, Sykes, but didn't really have places to publish this very rich research that he had conducted, nor did he have you know, his own personal museum for putting the artifacts that he retains of his family. So a part of what our project, we hope, is doing is not creating an archive, creating a museum, but giving people out there, you, me, people in the public, access to items, goods, documents that are in private hands but need to be in our hands for us to tell the public histories of the company. Sarah, how many minutes was that? That was five. Five more. Okay. I'll do two more case studies that will raise a couple of those. Um, issues. So if we go back here, um, starting with a baronet may suggest to you um, that we are only doing a very elite uh, kind of history in the project. The second case study that we published from one of our project associates tells a rather different story. And this is the story of Valentine's Mansion, which is a mansion in Ilford in Essex, um, which in the late 20th century um, was at risk, was potentially going to be either taken over, developed, turned into flats, raised, what, what have you. And local, area, uh, local residents in <coughs> Ilford um, decided that they would write a Herit Heritage Lottery Fund application to try and save Valentine's Mansion for um, their local community. Mm -hmm. And in the process, um, Georgina Green, one of these local residents, um, began to investigate its history. Not somebody who had a lot of um, historical experience before, didn't have a history degree, but local member of the residents who, as part of this bid for um, HLF funding, decided to do the history of Valentine's. And to her surprise and the surprise of other uh, local residents, they discovered a deep history connecting Valentine's in the 18th century to the East India Company. It's purchased um, by a, a very successful East India Company sea captain um, who becomes a major banker and insurance broker in the area. And Georgina's first class research, which has no relationship to academic institutions whatsoever, really um, created a new history of Ilford by mapping this series of different East India Company captains who clearly all retire together, repatriate, remit their fortunes together, and then set up English, but basically on East India Company fortunes, English banking and insurance companies. And they all live in this um, area together, a condensed area, um, and it tells a very different story of Valentine's Mansion. But Georgina's case study really also uh, created a series of arch archives. Georgina went on eBay, if we go back to Sujit's uh, question about all these objects flowing around on eBay and being bought by people, and are they being taken out of the public domain or put into the public domain? Are they becoming more private when they're purchased? Or are they actually becoming more public because people like Georgina buy? one of the pieces of the armorial porcelain of uh, Charles Raymond, who's the owner of Valentine's Mansion, and put that piece of armorial porcelain back on display in Valentine's Mansion, when indeed it's saved for the community. Uh, another case of this was the um, diver who recovered items, this is another part of the case study, from the Valentine's East India Company vessel, shipwrecked 
bringing loot back from India, effectively, uh, for Raymond, um, and at the bottom of the sea, not part of our archive, not part of what's publicly accessible to us, still in private hands, and yet made public, we hope, through a series of case studies that are then accessible by people and have moved an, into a number of exhibitions through Georgina's work with the British Library and with other, um, uh, uh, other uh, public institutions. Just very briefly, two minutes, got it. I'm gonna do my last one in two minutes then. Um, case study that we did at Osterley Park, which some of you may know, um, in Middlesex, West London, um, where am I with Osterley? <coughs> Osterley, a very interesting case of a Robert Adam neoclassical interior presented by the National Trust historically as a Robert Adam interior, so European neoclassical tradition, and indeed it's a Robert Adam interior who re rebuilt the house in the later 18th century. The history that hadn't been written of Osterley was the history of Osterley as an East India Company house. The child banking family which owns it are also East India Company directors, and the house itself, albeit it has a Truscan this and a Truscan that all through it, thanks to Robert Adam, is chock-a-block full of armorial porcelain lacquerware objects that could only have been obtained in the early 18th century through the child family's East India Company connections, through its connections to supercargoes, etc. So, Osterley, very, very interested in representing the house as having multiple heritages, not just one heritage, and not just a European heritage. So, worked very actively with us, and we hope we work very actively with them, to create a series of oral histories with current residents living nearby. Uh, the area is now very heavily South Asian British. Um, we did a series of oral histories, a series of exhibitions with the local community, and the exhibition that we did at Osterley was then migrated at their request to the local Sikh temple, the Gurdwara, where it's now being um, displayed. I will simply leave you with one thought about that process. Um, I've asked in, in my title, Who Owns History? Um, when we were doing the Osterley exhibition, we owned our interpretation, and the Individuals from the Sikh and Tamil communities with whom we work, they owned their contribution to that exhibition. When we re-displayed that exhibition at the Gurdwara, a whole series of people who had a very different take on their history, the history of Sikhs, the history of Sikhs in Britain, the history of Osterley, um, took over. And some of their interpretations were very contentious and very different. And to my mind, that was one of the best accomplishments that we had. So I'll end there. Thank you, Margot. It's an extremely inspiring um, project.